you know, it's an interesting story. I met Fleetwood Mac in uh, 1976. I was an engineer at a studio called Wally Hyders in Los Angeles in, in Hollywood. And I was asked, uh, they had just done a, 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 a live radio show called the King Biscuit Flower Hour. At, uh, and my company had recorded it for them. And part of the deal was that my company offered them free mixing if they came back or a deal on mixing. Uh, and I was the lead mixer there. And they asked me if I would do this band, Fleetwood Mac. And I said, nah, I didn't want to do it. And one of my friends uh, told me, Ken, you're crazy if you don't do it. You, these guys are up and coming. They're great, great new artists. And I said, all right, fine. So he said, go get the record. So I went and bought the record. The, the, the previous record, which is the Fleetwood Mac White Album, or the Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac Album, as it's called. And so on the pic, there's, I, and I saw all the pictures. I wanted to be ready for them when they came in. And so there was a picture of the, of the five band members. And I looked at, the, at each one of them and studied the name. I didn't realize they didn't put the names in the right order. So, so under Stevie's was Lindsay, and under Lindsay's was Stevie. It sounded good to me. So, so Stevie was the first to come into the, to the room, and I walked up to her, very cocky. And, I said, hey, Lindsay, big fan, great to meet you. And she just looked at me and says, I'm Stevie, thanks. But um, so, and then we, uh, so I mixed the, uh, the King Biscuit Flower Hour for them. We all became, became uh, good friends and had a really great time. And then they said, you know, we're starting an album uh, uh, next, uh, next several weeks up in Sausalito, California. Would you like to be the engineer? I said, okay. So me and my dog uh, went up to uh, Northern California with them and uh, spent three, 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 four months making the record, making the rumors. I felt that there was a little tension between Christine and Stevie, both being the, the girls, because Christine was the only girl in the band for 11 years or 11 albums before then. And suddenly this young little hippie chick was, was there and, and so there was a little tension there, but, but Stevie was so lovable that, that, you know, that, that Chris didn't have a chance, you know, and she, and she was also talented. And Chris, Christine realized that she had another girl in the, in the band who could take some of the pressure off of her to be, you know, always in the limelight and, and front stage, uh, front of stage. And it was, it was just a great experience. I mean, the whole Rumors album, that was Fleetwood Mac at their finest, I believe. They were untouched by, by stardom, and they were still human beings, and they, could, they were just normal people. So it was really a privilege for me to be there. I mean, absolutely, they were individuals. They were five individuals who just complemented each other. And, and it, if it wasn't for, um, let's say, John McVie's bass playing, uh, and and he would he was so good at interpreting what uh, the the writer and since he's not a writer Christine would come in with a song or Lindsay would come in with a song and Lin, and John would be would just pl come up with these amazing bass lines so as a as a band there was to me there was three writers and there was the band the backing with Mick and Mick and John and so when Mick and John would would add their rhythm section to to the, one of the writer's songs, and then the other two writers, who were, who were also musicians, would add their color and their creative, their creative input to to the songs. And but it, so it was a, I mean, it, it was I'd have to say it was a band, but it was a complete collaboration, like maybe like the Beatles did, where they're you know it, and they were all building and and this and we built oh, and we we took a song apart over and built it over again and again and again over twelve months. We'd revisit a song, you know, it's still not what is it. There's this, let's take this component out. This is a strange component. Let's change that component with this component. And so what I learned in working with Fleetwood Mac is that never, sat, never settle for second best. And so in that 12 months, we were always continually focusing on improving every aspect of the song. And we had no time constraints because the, the previous album was still climbing the charts. Actually, it peaked at number one, I think, at, in the eighth month of our recording which gave us such a benefit of freedom and knowing that the record was doing well and keeping the record companies off our back where they, they, they were just doing cartwheels back in their offices. They didn't, they didn't care what we did. You know, having, so we had this, all this freedom to keep improving, keep working and make the song better. Of course, with that whole thing on Rumors, they were, the bands, each band member was breaking up and there was 
the lyrics were insightful. Uh, they were hurt, hurtful because uh, they were talking about I hate you and I cheated on you. And, and they had to hear this every day over 12 months. And so the band at one point had, had said, you know what? If we're going to be professional, let's be professional. Let's just, okay, I know we're not together anymore and you don't love me and I don't love you. And we're going to keep hearing these in the lyrics, but we're going to put all that aside. We're going to just get through this and, and we're going to be a super, super band. By, by doing the best we can, which is what they did. It was absolutely surreal to see these five band members uh, fighting. Um, I, I, you know, I, I had no idea. I'd never had an experience with it. Uh, and I remember the first day I was, um, I was sitting there in the control room and, and I was, and I was, and uh, behind me was, was, uh, was Christine and, and John McVie's girlfriend. Chris and John were already in the process of breaking up, so John had the nerve to, to invite his girlfriend, a, Brit a British girl named Sandra, uh, to be there in the room. And Sa Sandra and Christine were getting along really famously, so they were sitting together on the couch behind, behind them. And so I'm sitting in my in my chair in the control room, working on the sounds, and and I'm hearing starting to hear a little con commotion behind me, and it gets louder and louder. And I spin my chair around. I can't with this chair, but I spin my chair around just to see. John Mavis say he, John was saying, I, uh, Christine was saying, I want to bring my boyfriend Curry Grant up to visit me uh, here in Sausalito because it was coming close to Valentine's Day here in uh, in, uh, in the United States, February fourteenth, and uh, and and John said, you can't, uh, no, I don't, I don't want you to bring him up there, and Chris said, but you've got Sandra up here, and John goes, she means nothing to me. You know that doesn't. You know that's it's, it. Does I don't care what you say, and both Christine and Sandra were, had a glass of champagne, and they just went, whoosh, whoosh. and I and I just had turned around just to see the the champagne go splash up into John's face, so that's that's when I knew there was something you know awry, in the in the in the sessions. Every day we'd come in, um, and the, somebody would, Christine or Stevie would have written a song the night before. And typically, I would I would ask them. I, I I was trying to keep everybody on a safe and sane schedule. I I said let's start at noon, let's end at midnight, and try not to do any you know, you know temptation of staying later and getting into a you know a, a, a jam or something like that. Because I always had a feeling that a, a philosophy that if you if you go till two in the morning, you're not going to come back till two in the afternoon. The twelve hour rule, which is guaranteed, that'll happen. So I try to say let's. Let's start at midnight. Let's uh, end at midnight. Let's 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 start at noon, and um, so every day at, at uh, noon we show up, and I would say, okay, what's everybody feel like working on today? And Christine might say, well, you did Stevie's song yesterday, so I have one, and then and then uh, and, and Lindsay might say, or she she might say, you know, I just have a little bit of one. I have an idea we could work out, and then Lindsay might say, I actually have a full one. I'm I'm ready to go on it. Oh, well, let's see, work on yours. So it was actually very organic. They would just say, "Who's got something today?" Um, and uh, fortunately, it seemed like every day, you know, it took us a I don't know a month before we had all the songs tracked initially, and then we would start going back and revisiting each song, saying, "Well, uh, now, now let's go back and do some harmonies on on, on Chris, on Chris, your first song that we did," and Lin and then Lindsay might say, "Okay, I want to do some guitars on it," and uh, we just kept um, laying bl um, more bricks down on the foundation. John grabbed his uh, bass, and Lindsey grabbed acoustic guitar, and eventually um, Christine started. Christine played organ, and then she started playing Stevie's parts so Stevie could sing. But it was dreams, and it was this, you know, and it, it was a really great song. And kind of an interesting story of technical side of it. We we started recording it, and we decided that it was it was very important because the song is very hypnotic. We wanted to make it as hypnotic as possible, so. Uh, as I discussed in my book, we 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 created had Mick play uh, um, um, until we got, we, f we could find um, about eight bars of just solid solid, just straight playing no 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 variations. And then we took that uh, I think it was like 16 bars actually, but we took the took the, uh, the 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 16 bars on the tape that we recorded. We were running running at 15 IPS, so 15 inches a second was about we had about. I don't know, 10 feet of tape at least. And so we cut the beginning of the tape to the end of the tape, made a big loop out of it, and then 
Then we decided we had to figure out how to fool the tape machine because the tape machine is very concerned about tape tension, proper tape tension. So we had to take this loop and, and put it on the tape machine, the drum loop, and then and all of us, Mick and Lindsay, would stand there and hold these reels of tape so the tape would, would slide around the reels and we'd have to hold just for the right amount of tension. We finally got it and hit record on a, on a second machine. On, on this machine, we hit play, played the drums, and this hypnotic thing went for four minutes straight. And it was just, just you know, just, it was just like, you know, you're getting sleepy. And it was just the perfect vibe for the, for the song. So you can actually listen to that. We put a little flanger on the, on, on the hi-hat. So you hear, hear the hi-hat actually going. Getting sleepy, right? So it was, it was fun. So, but that was, that was where the band was really being a band, supporting Stevie, and we all just had so much fun with that song. Well, you know, it's a part of being, um, I guess, perspective, uh, um, keeping a good perspective on what's, what's going on. Uh, sometimes the, the first take is, is brilliant. Like the first take of Lindsay uh, uh, playing the, uh, the, uh, the, the end of the chain, um, we were, it was, a, the chain was actually called um, um, uh, Keep Me There. It was a Christine Mavie song, and it was kind of a weedy song, as she would call it, not that great of a song. But, and I had these verses, choruses, and it was kind of, it's kind of stupid, but at the, at the end, uh, they were going to have this long play out, you know, the, the vamp. And so John spontaneously goes boom, ba ba boom, ba 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 boom, boom. And Lindsay like starts doing this guitar solo, and John starts playing the boom, da 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 And Lindsay starts screaming this solo, and he's playing the solo. That's the original solo that John did on the take. Well, we, we threw away the whole first half of the song, and we replaced it with a new, the, the chain with a kick drum, you know, and the dobro playing the parts in there. So that was the first part of the chain, and we, but we, we, we couldn't get rid of it. We couldn't, couldn't come to get rid of the second part, so we used that. So sometimes, you, if you're smart, you, you, you use what's brilliant, and we try to get that. So there's a lot of brilliant parts about uh, in, uh, all the songs and rumors, a lot of brilliant guitar that just came out of nowhere. But sometimes we go back and perfect it, uh, as we tried to with Dreams, but we couldn't beat that vocal. So, you know, if you can't beat it, you can't beat it. Stevie is so prolific that she, all of her songs were initially about 14 minutes long. She could just write and, and would just go on and on and on. And there were stories about her mother and grandmother and just, you know, meaningful stories about her dog or whatever, but they would go 14 minutes. And so it was my job mostly to, to have to sit with her and cut them down to three or four minutes. And there would be tears and tears, can you? That's, that's the part you can't take that line out. And, and so, but Silver Springs, we could never get it down into a manageable uh, length. Uh, we cut it down at, at, at many, many times, and uh, and <clears throat> and it was also a slower song. Well, back then in the in the 70s, we were everything was going to vinyl. Vinyl could only hold 22 minutes aside, and we were getting close. We were in our ninth month of recording by this time, and we were starting to to look ahead to. Uh, to what we were going to have for the songs on the album, and we realized we had some long songs like "Go Your Own Way" and and uh, some slow songs and medium slow songs, and and we were concerned that we might have too slow of an album. We didn't want to have the you put down the needle on side one and have it be all, all slow songs. So sometimes it can happen. You know, sometimes you can it can happen. That we did we did all the songs that they they sound in the same key or they sound similar. So you want to make sure it's not. He didn't make a mistake, so we started putting test running orders together, and we found that we couldn't make a, make a, a sequence of all the songs to fit the twenty within the twenty two minutes that didn't feel too slow. And uh, Stevie's as Stevie's song was uh, Silver Springs was such a great song, but and she had and she had she was very resistant to to taking it off the record. Uh, because she had given her mom the, the royalty to Silver Springs. So it was meant to be a gift, a financial gift. And, and, and then we finally, we all had a meeting without her. And we said, it, 
has got to go. And Lindsay said, you know, we got this other song. It's much more up tempo. It's called I Don't Want to Know. And so uh, one day when Stevie wasn't there, we uh, went out. We were at, still we were back in Los Angeles recording and and uh, set up the drums and bass and and recorded. I don't want to know. And I think it took 20 minutes or something. We just was one of the things just came right together, and it was a perfect uh, duet with Stevie and Lindsay, and, and um, that became the, the replacement for Silver Springs. And then Stevie came in and Mick had to go tell her that it's just not going to fit on the record, and uh, we're going to put it on the B side of the first single. Uh, it was a B-side of uh, Go Your Own Way, and, and CB was just devastated. But I was too. I really liked the song, and Silver Springs had a really nice production. It had a great vibe and all the lyrics, and so we were sad to see it go, but it was one of those things that, in fact, even my, in my book, I, I, I tell people, I give, I give them all a list of all the songs and the times. I said, you know, I invite them to, to come up with a running order that would work. Because, I mean, you could, the, the problem is if you have more than 22 minutes on a side, what happens is you have to, the, um, the way the needle works, well, you, we don't want to hear this, but, but you need to have 22 minutes pretty much balanced out on both sides. So you can't have 25 minutes and 21 minutes because then there's all this extra space on the record. So we had this mathematical problem we had to deal with. The sound of the album uh, kind of was left on to, onto its own. Uh, um, you know, I think it was uh, really had a lot to do with Richard Dash and myself. We had, uh, I liked, I, I liked really aggressive sounds, uh, edgy, edgy sounds, because the console I had back at Wall Hiders in L.A., the studio I came from, was a uh, uh, edgy, edgy sounding console. So I could make the you know, guitars really bite and drums really pop and and. So that's kind of what I did, and I, I, that's what I did to the, to the song. So they would play play a song, and I would get these, you know, edgy drums right in your face, and and then Lindsay's guitars was, you know, I, I believed in having uh, printing effects and and try to put as many effects on on the record. Back then, the standard feel, feeling was you just kept everything clean and you fixed it later in the mix. And I just said no. I mean, I. Let me put it. Let me put what I think it sounds really good on the on the guitars, and we would print all these effects, and there might be delay, panning left and right, and you know, or echo, and, and but that's what we lived with, and we said that's what the record's going to sound like, and we just kept all those effects, and we kept trying to make it sound like what we thought the final record would sound like. So, and with that, we were able to build um, um, really a, a think of I don't know a, fr a fruity sound. It's very full sound. And uh, uh, Lindsay, Lindsay, I was fortunate enough had had a lot of beautiful ideas for little sonic little bits, little harmonics. I mean, bing, 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 that would just sit in the back of the songs, or or just a, a thumping uh, guitar that just pulses. And and so we started. Uh, I started learning that what I was creating is layers of sounds that would go on top of the drums and the bass and between the vocals and, and the drums and bass and a keyboard that would be just little colors. It would do, catch your ear and go, oh, that's very nice. And, and I would use reverb to maybe place them back so they weren't standing out too close so it didn't get too cluttered. But that was the, that was the style of, the, of, the, of what we did on Rumors. And we, it, it caught on immediately with the band members and we were all very happy with where we were going. And, and we proceeded right to the end um, with that sonic uh, edginess. Rumors uh, was a, I believe, a, a big success because of the lyrics and because of the, of the musical layering and the fact that we took 12 months to to make the record and make it as perfect as possible. Uh, I saw Stevie, about two years ago, when she was making her last record, and uh, right in the studio actually she made it, and uh, she said to me, Ken, she says, she says I can't believe it. She says, you know how many days I have to make this record? 13 days. And we had 365 days to do rumors, and and and, uh, and it's you know it's like the change everything everything else changes, and how can you how can you make memorable you know um, perfect records in 13 days? Nobody's that good. Nobody's that smart. So you know, I, I and I I think the fact that we took the time and and there was all this the, the the lyrics seemed to resonate. Again, I don't listen to lyrics, but the lyrics seemed to resonate with millions and millions of people, and the the melodies seemed to 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 stir something that's that in deep inside all of us that uh, some some magic happened with that within that 12 month period that we made rumors <laughs>